Welcome back. I hope you enjoyed the coffee break. And welcome to the last part of the lecture on climate change and phenology modeling in horticulture. We covered climate change in the first session. Phenology modeling in horticulture part one was before the break. And now we're off to part two. Now we're working towards better chill models. This is one of the things we do here in Bonn. And we pursue four pathways to do this. We analyze historic bloom records for temperature responses. We try to make the best out of the existing models. We conduct controlled experiments. <clears throat> and we're trying to develop a holistic process-based model in the end that will hopefully be more reliable and more accurate than the models that are currently out there. So the first strategy we take is to try and tease re temperature responses out of long-term data sets. The tool we use is partially squares regression or projection to latent structures regression. And in many data sets, this has allowed us to delineate chilling and forcing phases. So what we're basically making use of here is long-term records of bloom dates or leaf out dates in this particular case of trees that were collected in a particular location and we combine them with weather data. Basically what we have is a regression um, analysis here, but regression is relatively difficult if you have one bloom date, for example, per year, but you have hourly or hourly temperatures or daily temperatures um, throughout the entire year. It's basically a situation where you only have a few observations, usually maybe even 50 years of record, which is a very long record, but still not all that many numbers if you compare it to 365 daily temperatures, for example. I don't want to go into the details on the analysis here, but we've basically been adopting methods from machine learning, uh, big data analysis that were uh, that I routinely applied in hyperspectral remote sensing. I've done a bit of that work and got inspired and then adopted this PLS regression for this type of analysis. And it's, it's worked pretty well. And basically what it gives us is model coefficients here shown in this diagram for each day of the year. So this is based on mean daily temperatures in this case. <clears throat> and what, you, what we can see here is clusters of high positive model coefficients that are also indicated as important by some other tests that, that you can do, you can apply to the data. Um, and the ones that stood out here as being positive and significant, so to say, are the ones shown in dark green here. We also have coefficients that are negative and significant, and those are the ones shown in dark red. And what you can see here is a pattern that emerges of this block of green bars and this block of red bars. And basically what these coefficients mean is that here, the positive ones here, mean that high temperatures in this particular period are correlated with a late bloom date. Here it's the opposite. High temperatures here are related to an early bloom date. And so what this means, if you combine it with our biological understanding of what goes on during the dormancy period, we can interpret the situation as this being the period of chill accumulation. So when it's warm, we have a slower accumulation of chill, which translate into a late bloom date. And here we have chill accumulating fast, or not, well, not chill accumulating. This is the period when chill doesn't matter anymore and the trees are responsive to heat, meaning that the warmer it is, the more rapidly we accumulate heat and the earlier the bloom date occurs. This pattern has been replicated in quite a number of different settings so far. It doesn't work that well in Germany, I must say, but it works very well in places with fairly warm winters where slightly above um, average temperatures, kind of warmer than usual, actually really lead to reduced chill accumulation. It's not necessarily the case 
here in Germany, but it certainly was the case in California, and it's very strongly the case, for example, in, in Tunisia. And so we've been using these kind of analyses to get a feeling for when this or endodormancy period is over, when the transition from the chill accumulation to the heat accumulation phase occurs. Now that we've identified these chilling and forcing periods, we can look at how the phenology responds to temperature deviations or temp to, to temperature um, during these periods. You can try and illustrate this. So let's look at the bloom responses to temperature during the chilling and forcing periods. Or in this case, it's actually the leaf emergence of walnuts in California that we're looking at. What is illustrated here is the response of the, the leaf emergence date, which is, which is shown by the color gradient here, with um, blue meaning very early leafing and red meaning very late leafing. This is what's shown here is a response of this metric to um, the mean temperature during the chilling period, identified by PLS regression, like in the slide before, and temperature during the forcing period. And what you can see is for a cool chilling period and a warm forcing period, we come up with the earliest bloom dates um, on record. And when the chilling period is cool and the, um, uh, the chilling period is warm, sorry, and the forcing period is the heat accumulation period is particularly cold, then we get a very late leafing date. So this is sort of what we expected, but it is nice to have it confirmed by this analysis here. Um, and such a figure actually allows us to get a feeling for what drives bloom dates or leaf emergence dates. Is it temperature during chilling, temperature during forcing, or possibly both? Well, in this case, we have diagonal lines here which probably indicate that both temperatures during chilling and during forcing have an influence. And we can come up with a hypothesis of how this relationship changes over or along an, a temperature gradient. And so here's our hypothesis of, of what we expect is likely to happen as we move along such a gradient. Um, <clears throat> and we're, we're hypothesizing that the, with the um, chilling period getting warmer and warmer, the contour lines of these kind of plots that we've, like the one that we've just see, uh, seen, uh, may change. Here we have a situation in the middle. We have a situation like we've just encountered in the in the slide before, where these contour lines, which are indicated here by these um, these uh, somewhat parallel lines, they indicate the uh, response pattern again with earlier spring phases, so earlier bloom dates, earlier leafing dates being here on the inner part of these of these curved lines. Yeah, so in this period here, or in this phase here, the, the um, uh, yellow area, chilling and forcing, both drive the spring phase timing. But we're suspecting that as with the warmer chilling period, when it doesn't really matter whether whether condition whether temperatures are a little bit higher or lower during the winter, it's still pretty chilly. In this situation, probably the um, spring phase timing should only rely on uh, or, or largely rely on conditions temperatures during spring. But there may be a point here in the um, well, in the pink area here, where winters have become so warm that there is actually chill accumulation that limits or that mainly drives phen phenology timing. And the warmer the chilling period or temperatures during chilling get here, the, um, the later phenology may become. And how warm the spring is almost doesn't matter. So does this really happen? So this is a hypothesis at some point that we came up with a few years ago. Does this really happen? Well, let's see. We have here a data set on, on apples. It's the cultivar Fuji, which is the pretty much the only apple cultivar grown in China. 
on a larger scale. And we have here the phenology response along a temperature gradient in Shaanxi pro province in China. What you see here by the different colored lines is the situation in different uh, locations with slightly different temperatures. Yeah? So we have here again the temperature during the chilling period and the temperature during the forcing period. And we see well, the slope of these lines basically indicating the relationship of influences of chilling temperature and forcing temperature. We see for the coldest sites, these lines here are actually quite close to horizontal, not very steep, indicating that there may in fact not be much of an influence of temperature during chilling. As conditions get warmer, however, now we don't have we no longer have a mean chilling temperature of 2.6 degrees but we actually have 6 degrees so quite a bit more then we get a much stronger gradient here much steeper slopes indicating that indeed at this point we do have a stronger influence of chilling temperatures that uh, modulates the effect of spring Basically, in the green area, you could, you could say, well, it's almost only spring temperatures, only forcing period temperatures that have an influence. In this case here, this seems to be quite uh, clearly not, not the case. And you can see a transition along this temperature gradient. We have a couple more, more locations here at intermediate uh, positions on the gradient. Um, it does actually look that there is such a gradual transition. And so an increasing influence of chilling temperatures with warming of the chilling period. We've done another analysis also in also in China. It's not quite as clean. It was the, this was for apricots, but they were actually um, very uh, very likely different cultivars and slightly different genetic materials of the different places. But we have a stronger temperature gradient here of mean temperatures during the chilling period of less than minus five degrees here in Jiangsu and about 10 degrees for uh, Guiyang, in a much uh, you know, rather different geographic location, and the other sites are in between. And also here we see this um, gradient again. Yeah? So we see an increasing slope of these lines here as we move towards warmer chilling period. This again indicates that probably this in the, at this location the main driver, almost the exclusive driver of spring phase timing is in fact spring temperatures and here we have at least well an equal weight of uh, conditions during the chilling period. Now the extreme end of the gradient of course would be where it gets really really warm <clears throat> and we've also seen this this is actually why we why we started moving or uh, work, working in Tunisia because here we have somewhat marginal conditions. We have very warm winters here that are approximately the warmest uh, among any locations that grow deciduous fruit trees. Now here's for pistachios in Tunisia these same contour lines and we see that pretty much as we predicted in our hypo hypo hypothetical diagram in the beginning we have nearly vertical contour lines here. This means that in this particular location, for this crop at least, the, uh, the timing of spring phases, in this case the, the um, bloom dates of pistachios, are driven pretty much exclusively by how cold the winters are. And with winters getting warmer, bloom occurs later and not earlier as we may traditionally have expected. We can also use the same diagram not to describe changes across uh, along an ele a, a climatic gradient, but changes across time, the impacts of climate change. What may be derived from this is different phases of climate change that may also affect us here eventually. At the moment, we're almost certainly in, in this area here where um, our phenology is driven almost exclusively by spring temperatures. There are even some studies from our climatic region here 
that have proposed models that don't include winter temperatures at all because it doesn't seem like they're much, they have much of an influence at the moment. But this may change over time. This may just be the first phase of kind of a transition towards a different climatic situation where we have this strong advance in phenology in response to, um, to warming temperatures because of the spring effect. But we may be seeing a weakened response eventually when the effect of inadequate chill in winter starts kicking in. I don't know if you have, but I've seen a few indications in the literature already indicating that phenology is not advancing as strongly anymore and it, as it did a few decades ago. At some point we may even see stagnation. There may no longer be an advance. And possibly at the latest stage here, phase four, we may see delayed spring phases. This is, this is really when we've climbed up this gradient and reached a point where phenology is dra driven mainly by temperatures in winter and no longer so strongly by temperatures in spring. This may be the future that's uh, in store for us here. It will probably take a very long time to reach stage four in this particular case. But who knows? This is really not very well understood at all and it's very difficult to predict at the moment how this will really proceed in the future. We are also trying to make the best out of existing models. So we have some active develop development of models going on. And one of the problems so far has been that the heat and the chill models have been taking as is basically without parameterization for specific conditions. So we've just been taking the models with the, the original set of parameters without ever really adjusting them for a particular cultivar or for a particular location. There have been a few little uh, tweakings here and there, but overall this has not been a very systematic approach, especially for the dynamic model. This has almost never happened. We've also been neglecting the <clears throat> possible interaction between chill and heat in most of the models that have been built. Uh, and um, well, we've been trying to develop a framework here now that overcomes these constraints. We're using a chill model that is similar to the dynamic model in structure, which it uses different parameters now, but the structure is basically the same. And um, the way we've achieved this is to collaborate with people who are better at modeling than we are. And basically, we've tried to emulate the working style of Amnon Eris's group in Israel and started collaborating with uh, Carsten Urbach, who's a uh, professor in, of theoretical physics here in Bonn, who had absolutely zero problems understanding how this model works and all these complicated equations and could really help us um, implement it in a more effective way. We also have a heat model here that's similar in, in structure to the growing degree hours uh, model. And we have a gradual transition function between the two. So this concept by Harrington et al. of this, um, po this possibility line uh, concept where we have different models, different combinations of chill and heat that can, can um, lead to bloom. This has been implemented in this model. Now all parts of this modeling framework here can be fully parameterized. So if we have long-term bloom dates, we can fit a model here that sets plausible um, parameters that fit the data set for all, all variables in these models. So here's the structure of the dynamic model again for the, for the cool part. We have this gradual transition structure here for the, the, um, con for the conversion between chill and heat accumulation, basically with the effectiveness of heat increasing as we accumulate more chill. And then we have a heat model here that has the structure of the growing degrees model. I don't want to go into too much detail here in this class, but let me again advertise our module for the winter semester where we'll be doing hands-on modeling with the Chill R package. We had very promising first results for cherry, apple and pear data sets from Klein Altendorf. You know Klein Altendorf, the experimental station here at the University of Bonn, where we have long-term data sets for all these species. And we're currently working on 
testing the model also in other locations with other data sets to see if it also does well there. Yeah, more tests are currently ongoing and we're going to be applying it in a number of different settings in the future. Manuscript coming soon, so soon hopefully we'll be able to publish this model. We also run controlled experiments. Well, let's call them semi-controlled experiments. Running controlled experiments with trees is hard. Um, because trees are large and you need large growth chambers and and everything and especially when it comes to chill treatments you would also need kind of controlled cool conditions which are even harder to to implement than controlled warm conditions but we have been creative and made use of three temperature regimes in Klein Altendorf ambient conditions just outside in the orchard we've made use of an unheated greenhouse and a heated greenhouse so here we have three environments, none of which are particularly well temperature controlled. There's a lot of up and down, as there would be in any any normal orchard as well. Um, and we've created even more variation in, in, in temperature by frequently moving groups of trees between these environments. So for example, at some point in time, we would take a few trees out of the ambient conditions and move them to the unheated greenhouse. We take a few other ones, move them to the heated greenhouse and while mixing up trees all the time, while of course keeping close records of when each tree was in a particular place. This then allowed us the rapid generation of a long-term data set. So this was again Eduardo Fernandez who led this experiment and in the last winter season, the one that ended last year, he was able to collect 33 years of weather data for apple trees. Of course, these were not real years, they were virtual years. They were just generated by moving the trees back and forth between these environments. We also do some process-based modeling. Unfortunately, it seems that complete understanding of dormancy processes will remain elusive for the foreseeable future. It doesn't seem like we'll get there anytime soon. But we'll try to, to summarize the existing information while acknowledging knowledge limitations, because it is possible to make models that don't require us to know everything for sure. And we try to make this happen by making use of approaches that are typically used to analyze decisions under uncertainty. So this has been this is the other pillar of the work in our group where we analyze decisions, but we're applying these methods here now to dormancy modeling. So basically the idea here is that you have to make a decision. You want to make some sort of forecast of what's going to happen, even though you don't f fully understand the situation. This is what all decision makers basically have to do. And there are useful methods in that space that we're trying to bring into this type of analysis. So we've done some participatory dormancy modeling with groups of experts to try and capture everything that the experts really know about the processes that are going on. Because so far, even in the dynamic model, we're not really sure what, what is being modeled here. There's some equations and stuff, but we're not even sure which substances are involved in all that. But of course, there is a lot of knowledge on these processes and the substances and the structures, etc. And we're trying to assemble all of this. And the goal of this is a process-based probabilistic model that expresses what we know while also acknowledging our uncertainties. I find this to be a pretty interesting mission um, and uh, we've well made a bit of progress on, on getting there. For example, we had a dormancy modeling workshop in 2018 in the context of this project here, Phenological and Social Impacts of Temperature Increase. This is dormancy research in Germany, Tunisia and Chile and we assembled a workshop here in, in Klein Altendorf in, in, and in Bonn in 2018, where we brought all these people together to really get our um, understanding of dormancy processes onto the table and hopefully ideally convert it into a model. Um, this is one of the first drawings that came out of this. Uh, wasn't directly possible to implement it, <laughs> at least not to us, but we have made a bit of progress in the meantime of uh, well, in, in getting this into 
mathematical format or at least into conceptual format first. More development is still in progress, but it's harder than anticipated. But as a first step, we have recently come up with a conceptual framework of bud dormancy. This was this work was led by Erika Fadon, who's who was who was in that workshop in 2018, and since then he's, he took a position with us here, and now she's working here in Bonn, and she's also a teacher in this class, as you may already have noticed. And she's assembled what we know about bud dormancy and about all the various processes that are going on. You see here the different phases of dormancy. You see dormancy, dormancy establishment here, then the endodormancy period, and the eco-dormancy period. And we know of a bunch of categories of processes that go on. There's something here on, on the transport of signals and materials in the plant. We know that there's a role of phytohormones. We know that there is genetic and epigenetic regulation, and there's probably a pretty critical role of carbohydrate um, processes that are involved here. I don't want to go into the details of this, and Erica is much um, better placed to describe this at some point, hopefully, um, during your studies. But this is going to be the blueprint for our further de model development. We want to use this as guidance for putting together a mathematical model that describes all this. And also as guidance for, uh, for our experiments, because this having such, an, con such a conceptual understanding first now allows us to also identify knowledge gaps and interesting um, points, entry points for our experiments. We want to take a more detailed look at phenology. This is what we have actually just published already. <clears throat> we try to uh, do detailed tracking of bud development over time. So what you can see here in this illustration is for like throughout the dormancy season, for different points of time, for different levels of heat accumulation, how many buds were in particular development stages. This BBCH scale here basically is a, is a scale that, that's quite widely used for um, determining the developmental stage of a bud. And this diagram here gives an illustration of how many buds at a given point are in what uh, stage of development, depending on the chill accumulation level. So you want to make use of such information to also produce better quantitative predictions of how chill accumulation and heat accumulation affect bloom dates and bud development. We also do microscopic, microscopic observations. This is again Erika's uh, line of work to take a closer look and to figure out when we really start changes to uh, ch uh, seeing changes in the buds and well, possibly get some, in, some clues here, some indications of how to model this in a quantitative way. Also started doing carbohydrate analysis here um, to analyze well to to really quantify when um, the um, these the concentrations of the various carbohydrates the storage forms and the mobile forms um, when, when these changes start happening we've also we're also exploring ways to analyze plant hormones here and we're looking at some other ways of possibly visualizing the changes that occur in buds We'll soon have a PhD student starting work on epigenetics of dormancy, which I'm pretty excited about because I, I don't know so much about epigenetics so far, but I'm really looking forward to learning a lot over the next few years. Yeah, and there are other visualizing visualization experience, uh, procedures that we can use. We can do CT scans of buds and all kinds of options are out there that haven't really been explored. So I think there's a lot of exciting work coming up over the next few years here in this in this space and if anyone is interested you're welcome to get involved what is also going to start pretty soon is a new project that is coming up here in our group it's called ara medor adapting mediterranean orchards science-based design of resilient fruit tree portfolios for the mediterranean region 
This is a collaborative pro uh, project starting hopefully in June 2020 with partners in Spain, Tunisia and Morocco. And we're trying to do lots of different things. There's a lot of, lot of dormancy modeling involved here, making predictions also of what species and what cultivars will be suitable in the future in um, the Mediterranean region. That's really the main partner, uh, partner region. But there'll also be some experimental approaches and tree dormancy that we'll be doing here. And we'll be also uh, refining and further developing our R packages and our, uh, the, our phenology analysis and projection tools. Some conclusions. The existing dormancy models are inadequate for adaptation to serious climatic threats. I hope I was able to demonstrate this. And we really renewed, need renewed efforts. We have to validate the models that exist. We have to make use of their strength, try and reduce their weaknesses. And we should try to incorporate the decades of scientific advances that have happened in the space of dormancy into new models. The dynamic model was published in 1987, but it's still the best model we currently have. And it is a great model, considering what was possible at the time. But you would imagine that by now we probably have learned a bit more. We have better computational tools and all those things to develop something better. And this is really what our mission is. Um, maybe this comes a bit too early for you guys, but we will have a PhD position to be filled soon in this Adamedor project, uh, working on orchards in the Mediterranean region and doing lots of modeling and stuff. Very, very interesting. Maybe you are more advanced than you look, or you know somebody else who is uh, interested in or is looking for a PhD position in such a field right now. Please let him know quickly and point him to us. Thanks for your attention.